Hi, my name is Mark Tilson. I'm head of watch buying for the Watches of Switzerland Group in the US and the UK. I often say this is the best job in the world, and I'm very privileged today to be sat in our MBNF boutique in Watches of Switzerland, 155 Regent Street. It's it's our first MBNF. Um, account in the UK, although we have one in, in Las Vegas. So that's exciting enough. Um, and without coming over really sycophantic, um, I'm absolutely honoured to be with, with Max Busser, uh, the founder, the creative force, the, the CEO of MBNF. Uh, Max, welcome. Thank you very much, Marcus. It's great to see you. Likewise. It's, be, it's, it's, it's a big step for the company. For us, it is yes. Yeah, it's a, for both of us, it's a big yeah. step. It's a rare chance these days uh, to actually meet um, a living, a living watchmaker, a, a creative force behind a brand. Um, you know, most of the brands that we we deal with are, are very old and very well established, and you don't meet Mr. Breguet anymore because obviously he's not around anymore. It's great to see you, and I want to start um, because uh, our, our viewers and listeners um, may not know anything about you. So I'd like to kind of briefly start about your early life. Um, your, your education, your family, your, what, what, kind of, what kind of drove you towards watches? How did you end up, uh, how did you end up working in the watch industry? Uh, by chance. <laughs> it was nothing in my family brought me there, except that my, my dad was Swiss okay. and that I was brought up in Switzerland. So, mm -hmm. so people think that that's normal. And I remember when I was 18, my parents said, we want to give you a watch. It's a very Swiss thing. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and they gave me a budget, which I think was in those days the equivalent of today's 500 pounds, which was an enormous amount of money for them and for me. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I went and asked people around. And one day I'm at university sitting next to a, a guy and I'm like, what are you wearing? And he says, it's a Rolex. I said, what's a Rolex? <laughs> I'm 18 years old. <laughs> yes. So you see, nothing really prepared yeah, yeah. me for this. And um, so I, I, um, I was a very lonely child. I'm an only child, mm -hmm. but actually very lonely. Um, didn't have many friends, was, would have liked to have a lot of friends. It's not by chance that my brand is called MBNF, Maximilian Busser and Friends. Mm -hmm. um, was a bit of a geek mm -hmm. in days where being a geek was not at all sexy. Right. <laughs> and uh, I was programming my Commodore 64, for wow. those who remember. And, um, and I dreamt at the same time, well, that's maybe made me different, of being a car designer. Okay. From the age of four to the age of 18, I was drawing cars, 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 mm -hmm. cars. And um, when I was 18, I decided I was going to become a, an engineer first right. so that I could actually understand the engineering mm -hmm. of a car before designing them. Mm -hmm. And so I did uh, Polytechnic in, in Lausanne mm -hmm. uh, and did a master's there. And during those years, I fell upon watchmaking. Mm -hmm. But not through the courses, even though it should have been. I always remember, we're talking of the late 80s, that um, in our microtechnology course, our professor gave us exactly two hours on watchmaking out of five years. Wow. And during those two hours, he told us, you probably will never be doing this because the whole industry is going to go bankrupt. But I'm just going to explain to you a balance wheel and a barrel. And I actually remember not understanding a word of what he was saying because it was so complicated. Um, no, but I actually sent out, at some point I did a, um, how do you say, a, uh, a thesis yes. on uh, mechanical watchmaking because I tried to understand why people were paying so much money mm -hmm. for such antiquated technology. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and so um, that was, I was probably in my early 20s uh, at the university. And I sent letters out to all the great brands. Mm -hmm. And virtually everyone sent me back a letter saying, well, if you come to this day, I'll, we'll give you an hour. The we would, was the CEO. Mm -hmm. Now imagine today a wow. student sending a, whatever, an email saying, mm -hmm. I'm doing a study. Do you have time for, does your CEO have an hour for me? Yes. These companies were so small mm -hmm. that actually they gave me each an hour. Wow. And I met the uh, CEO of Vacheron Constantin, mm -hmm. Jaeger Lecoultre, uh, Audemars Piguet, uh, Breguet. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking of 1989, I think, yeah. And um, Mr. Gerald Genta himself, mm -hmm. the head of Oris' yes. company in those days. And um, they all told me the same thing. I said, young man, we know what we're doing is pointless today, <laughs> but it's so beautiful. Wow. And I was like, Wow. Mm -hmm. For the first time in my engineering stu study, somebody actually talked about beauty yes. and not only mat. Yes. And I was like, wow, wow, that's great. Uh -huh. and, um, and then they went on to say, look, we're probably going to all go bankrupt. But if that happens, whole generations of knowledge 
and mentorships of mentors to apprentices mm -hmm. will disappear. How to do that Breguet curve at the end of a spiral, mm -hmm. how to do that, that interior angle, uh, hand finishing, etc. It's just going to disappear. And they, they talked to me about humanity. Mm -hmm. And I just fell in love with that world. Amazing. But I never expected to work with it. Mm -hmm. Never. So I come to the end of my studies. I'm now interviewing with all the big companies, the Procter and Gamble's and the mm -hmm. Nestle's, like, go and get a, some corporate life. Mm -hmm. And um, one day I'm skiing with some friends. That's what we do in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And in, in January, I always remember. And we stop at a cafe on the, on the slopes. And there's the CEO of Jäger Le Coultre, mm -hmm. who I'd interviewed. Oh, hello, do you remember me? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I remember you. Yeah. Uh, what are you doing? Have a coffee with us. Mm -hmm. And he starts asking me, what are you going to do? Oh, a P&G, Nestle, all that. Mm -hmm. He's like, OK. Mm -hmm. And at the end, I tell him jokingly, well, Mr. Belmo, uh, <laughs> if they don't give me a job, you can always give me a job at Jaeger. He laughs, yeah. I laugh, and that's it. Mm -hmm. A week later, he uh, has me called up. He says, would you like to come? Well, somebody says, would you like to go and see Mr. Belmo? Mm -hmm. I'm like, sure. So I take my old. Uh, it, was a, it would be called a Vauxhall Nova in this yes, country. Yes, I know you mean this. Uh, and I, so I take that up to the Valley Jew, and there is the interview of my life. It lasts three hours. And oh. Henri John Belmont, the man who's going to save Jaeger Le Coult, uh -huh. basically sells me his dream how he's going to sell that, mm -hmm. save that company, not sell that, save that company. And, um, and at the end, he says, OK, I need a young man like you, a young engineer who likes watchmaking. Uh, I'm going to create a job for you as a product manager. And I said, oh, so um, thank you very much, but I have to think about it. And it was not my idea mm -hmm. to go into a soon to bankrupt uh, industry <laughs> in a small <laughs> company, the Valley Jew. Yeah. And he said, you just have to know one thing in your life. Do you want to be one amongst 200,000 people in a big corporation? Mm -hmm. Or do you want to be one of the three or four people who are going to save this company? Wow. Yeah. Next day I called him up. I said, OK. And that's the beginning of the story. Wow, that's incredible. Incredible, crazy story. Imagine what would have happened if I hadn't been skiing that day. Yes. If I hadn't stopped on that slope, uh -huh. I would be maybe selling Pampers today. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I wake yeah, up yeah. screaming yeah, in the middle yeah. of the night thinking about that. Yeah. How 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 faith yeah. happens. It's incredible. And I'd have an extra hour in my day that I didn't, <laughs> which, <laughs> which 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 wouldn't be as good as what's happening now. So you, you worked for Zsa and that's actually where I met you in, 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 the, in, the, in the 90s. You stayed there for a while and then, and then obviously you, you left, you kind of outgrew your role there and you, and you went to Harry Winston. So uh, seven incredible years at Jaeger Le Coult. Um, so I'm going to say Zsa Le Coult and I'm yes. going to say Jaeger Le Coult so yeah. everybody can now start posting uh, after your video. And, yeah. um, and it was incredible because we, with 31 years ago, nobody wanted a reversal. Yes. The company was in very dire situation. Mm -hmm. And we, we grew that company all together with an incredible team. Mm -hmm. And every headhunter would call me. I was like, no, I'm not interested. This is my, I found my surrogate family. Yes. I loved working there. Mm -hmm. and, um, and one day, one of the top headhunters only does like chief officers um, calls me and like, well, I'm still this, this little manager. And they say, look, we've heard about you. Maybe you could do this job. Mm -hmm. And I'm a bit curious. I'm a bit mm -hmm. like a cat. And so, um, so uh, I, go, I drive down to Geneva. They, they interview me for an hour and a half and tell me, look, you're 10 years too young by far. I was 31. Mm -hmm. But you can maybe do this job. I mean, what are you talking about? Managing director of Harry Winston timepieces. Wow. And so I went to all the interviews completely mm -hmm. calm, cool, and collected because I didn't have a chance in a million of yeah. having the job. Mm -hmm. And they actually chose me. And, um, and so that was the beginning of another incredible adventure because Harry Winston Timepieces, when I joined, was virtually bankrupt. It was a small entity mm -hmm. of this great New York-based jeweler. It's 23 years ago. Yeah. And, um, and so um, we had to reconstruct that little company. And, and then it was, it was an incredible learning curve where I had no idea I could do this. I had no idea I had it in me to save the company and then to grow it. And um, so I discovered that. And I also discovered something else is the, the bigger the company was growing, the more success we had and the more I had what men usually want, mm -hmm. which is power, recognition, mm -hmm. money. And coming from where I come from, it was, I never even dreamt of all of that. And the less I was enjoying myself, and 
I didn't really understand. And then a lot of things happened. I uh, often speak about my dad passing away on the 31st of December 2001. And unfortunately, I wasn't in great terms with my dad, which is my biggest regret in my life. Mm -hmm. And so I just got on with my life and that was it. And then a year later, I realized this is clearly an issue I haven't worked on. Mm -hmm. And I I decided to go into what we call it therapy, mm-hmm. and which when you're a Swiss engineer is not your first choice. Yeah, and uh, and so um, worked on that and talked about th- a lot about regrets. Yes. And at some point, the therapist asked me, so, okay, we've spoken about your dad, but let's talk about your life. Like, mm-hmm. you, what, what other regrets do you have? And I realized I had everything what men want, mm-hmm. and I actually had not what I wanted. Mm. Um, the little creative boy, this little artistic boy had been, had become a marketeer. All I was doing was all the time creating products. I've always created products, yes. but in the watch industry, I was always creating products because I thought that was what people would want. Mm-hmm. And whatever I did was thinking, ah, oh, more people will like that. So it was not about what I wanted. It was not about what I liked. Yes. It was trying to please people. Yes. And I realized, if I want to be proud of myself the last day of my life, mm-hmm. if, if looking back that, that last minute or that last hour, you look back, do you want to be that guy who's been creating products you didn't even like? Try and do something you believe in. Yes, yes, yes. And, and the other thing is, I think my parents were probably the most honest and respectful people I know mm-hmm. uh, or I knew. And, um, and in business, the higher you get into hierarchies, the more you have to deal with horrible people. <laughs> you have to deal with people will backstab you and manipulate you and bully you. And, 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 and the more there's power and money involved and the more you have to deal with these. And you have to invite them to lunch. It's like, what am I doing? I mean, all the values that my parents tried to give me, I'm actually accepting to work with people who have none, none mm-hmm. of those which, people who in your private life, you just walk away. Yes. But in your professional life, you have to actually deal with them. Mm-hmm. And I thought, I just don't want to do this anymore. Hence, when I created the brand mm-hmm. and called it MBNF, Maximilian Busser and Friends, it's just because I had no other way to talk about Max Busser and people who share the same values. That's yeah. what I really yeah. meant. And, um, and so I decided those were the two angles of and I had to have my own company yes. because I didn't want any shareholders to tell me you have to grow and make more profit. I just wanted to be able to create. And hence, um, what was it? I think April or May, to April 2005, I resigned to everybody's shock mm-hmm. and um, was freed on the 15th of July 2005. 10 days later, I incorporated MBNF with uh, all my little money, which was not a small amount, but if if you want to create a watch brand, which creates its own movement, I would have needed a minimum of 10 times that. And um, started working all alone in my flat for the first two and a half years and without a salary and uh, assembling this whole idea of bringing together incredible artisans Mm -hmm. and people who've got the same values as me and trying to create these kinetic sculptures. And that's the beginning of MBNF. That was 2005. Amazing, uh, amazing. And, and I mean, the, the, the and friends bit is, is a crucial bit. And I guess in some ways that, that came from your time at Harry Winston, where you, you work with, uh, you know, Felix Baumgartner and- and um, yeah, Alter and yeah, François Bourgeau. Uh, all, 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 all those guys. And, and that carried through into, into, the, into the MBNF, but then it was, it was all about all about you and your, and your friends as opposed to what maybe Harry Winston wanted uh, or, or the direction of I'll Harry Winston. This was. way, by by creating the Opus uh, at Harry Winston, I well before actually creating Opus, I, I started meeting all these incredible independent mm-hmm. watchmakers of the HCI, and um, they had one point in common. None of them were there because they thought there was any money, mm-hmm. because there was no money. Yes. Because to be to create a small artisan brand is completely, it's complete business suicide. Mm -hmm. And so all of them were doing this because that's the only thing they love doing. Yeah. It's their calling. Mm -hmm. And, um, and 
Now, of course, in the last 24 months, we've suddenly all become super successful and everybody suddenly put this big spotlight on us. Mm -hmm. But for 20 years, only a few crazy geeks like you and me <laughs> could understand what we were trying to do. And, um, and so it was, it was a calling. Yeah. And I realized that there is a way of actually owning a company and creating what you believe in and not doing what you think people want. Mm -hmm. They opened my eyes to that. I, and I'll never thank François Paul, Vianney, Felix, and all the others, because they, told, they showed me it was possible. And from there onwards, it became my dream. I want to be like them. And that's what happened. Uh, uh, well, thank goodness. Um, uh, and the designs you you create um, with, your, with your collaborators, your enjoyment of science fiction that must have informed some of the designs, you know, the, the, the designs, you know, the, the, the frog and the, and, the, and, the, um, and the bulldog and the, the flow, all these, all these incredible well, time machines, literally, um, uh, and don't look like conventional watches, but they're uh, uh, part of your, 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 your child's imagination coming through. It's, um, so when I created MBNF, the whole idea was Watchmaking is art. Mm -hmm. Everybody says it, but if it's art, why do 99.9% .9 of all watches more or less look the same? So I wanted to create something as a kinetic sculpture which gives time. Mm -hmm. Giving time was not the point, yes. even though the watchmaking is extraordinary, mm -hmm. as much in engineering as finishing, but giving the time is not the point because it hasn't been the point since 1972. No. So <laughs> let's deconstruct beautiful traditional watchmaking and reconstruct it as a sculpture and that's when i started creating for myself sculptures and unwittingly i actually transformed it into a real psychotherapy okay. and when i was initially sketching where i would stop was probably things which anchored me as a kid that young kid who was always lonely and who dreamt of being Captain Kirk rather mm -hmm. than Luke Skywalker. Mm -hmm. I used to make model airplanes because I was bored to death and therefore I'd make model airplanes. I dreamt of being a car designer. So all those things slowly came into, the, into my creations, but not on purpose. I never sat on saying, let's create a spaceship. Yeah. I would sketch and mm -hmm. when I was like, oh, this is cool. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, that actually looks like a spaceship. Yeah. And um, then afterwards it became a little bit more, because actually my creative process went from sketching mm -hmm. to actually imagining. Yes. The brain is an incredible muscle where you can actually, it trains itself. Mm -hmm. And so um, it, at some point now for the last decade, I don't draw anymore. It, ideas just pop into my head. And uh, which is a bit scary, isn't it? And, uh, and so I sort of see stuff, <laughs> Christopher Walken in Dead Zone. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and so I'm like, uh, I, I imagine things and then I sketch them. Mm -hmm. But before I would just doodle and let my mind wander. Okay. And so, so of course now I'm pretty much a schizophrenic creator, meaning you've got horological machines, mm -hmm. which are, are 3D kinetic sculptures, which are based on my childhood and other things. Mm -hmm. Now who, thinks that creating a watch which looks like a bulldog is actually a good idea. <laughs> so, I so I think it's a great idea, but very few people would at the beginning of the idea go, oh, that's a great way. Or, Do you really want to bankrupt your company? And, uh, and so I just go along, create something I find. Um, it's funny because a lot of people have asked me, what's the, what's the defining, uh, how do I say, it? impetus to your, your creativity? Mm -hmm. And for me, it's, wouldn't it be cool if? Yes. Wouldn't it be cool if? If I don't have that phrase at some point in the process at the beginning, then it doesn't happen. Yeah. So horological machines are my psychotherapy mm -hmm. and legacy machines, which are now around watches, something yes. I said I would never do when I created MBNF, um, are my way of saying thank you mm -hmm. to the greatest master watchmakers of the 19th and 18th century. Those who created what everybody's doing today. Yes. I mean, Perpetual calendars, chronographs, split-second chronographs, tourbillons, minute repeaters, grand sonneries, foudroyant, you name it, equation du temps, all those incredible complications that our industry is doing today were created by the geniuses mm -hmm. between, I'm going to say, 1750 mm -hmm. and 1870. Mm -hmm. yep. And so for me, it was saying thank you and taking it to another dimension. Yes. And so legacy machines are created very much intellectually. Mm -hmm. Well, horological machines are created emotionally with guts. Yes. So I'm completely schizophrenic today. 
yeah. <laughs> amazing. And, and that that um, that creative process is is sort of is interesting. I mean, I, again, I read somewhere um, you lead quite a disciplined a disciplined life in how you organise your time, how you organise your private life, how you organise your working life, and if I recall correctly. Uh, a couple of days a, a week or something, you take an hour out where you kind of disconnect, just look at the flowers, look at the garden, look at whatever's in front of you and, 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 and I don't know, cleanse your mind and, and, and open it up to, to whatever the creative things that might, might pop into your mind. Yeah, I discovered over years that I actually create only when I'm completely alone mm -hmm. and I don't have any outside influence. I mean, there's no way I can create in a meeting or in front of my computer or in front of my friggin' phone. Um, I have to be completely, that's where, that's where it happens. Yeah. So, um, so it's, it's, it's a whole discipline because as an entrepreneur, a self-finance entrepreneur for the last 17 years, every second, every minute is important. And so um, you have to take an hour and just put yourself on a, on a deck chair, if it's mm -hmm. a good weather, mm -hmm. and without your phone, and just think. Yeah. You know, an hour? Mm -hmm. Just thinking is something we've completely forgotten how to do. Mm -hmm. And it's a really long time, 60 minutes. So when my, my daughters were young, I would actually just basically fall asleep because I was so sleep yes. deprived because yeah. of doing the, the nights. With, uh, and But then you've got this hour and you let your mind wander. And sometimes it'll be something creative, sometimes it'll be something entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And then you go places and you imagine something and, and you, you pull on these threads which are actually in your mind mm -hmm. and it brings you and you go down that rabbit hole yes. and you have no idea where you go. Mm -hmm. And that's extraordinary as a creator is not knowing where your mind is bringing mm -hmm. you. Now, I've created some pretty incredible things which have never been done before, mm -hmm. but Coco Chanel had a saying which I love. He who insists on his creativity has no memory. Whatever I've created yeah. is that I've been influenced mm -hmm. by thousands of different things which I've seen, lived yep. uh, from other creators mm -hmm. and in other worlds, in maybe it's been a piece of furniture, mm -hmm. maybe it's been an animal, maybe. Yeah. And then afterwards, it suddenly comes out, mm -hmm. but I don't know how it comes out. Yeah. So when I take credit, I just take credit for having a weird mind de facto, oh, but, but it's, it's, yeah. It's all the apps, everything you've absorbed, which you bring out in a different way. And I suppose in a way that, that sitting there quietly and, and, and thinking is almost like, you know, as a child sketching things out in your, in your bedroom and just things appear on a page and you say, that looks like a car or that looks like a spaceship. Um, so so when, when you've had your idea and you think, oh, we, we could do a, a whatever, um, and it's probably a difficult question to answer, but uh, roughly how long can it take for the idea to become the finished article? I mean, particularly, I mean, you, you work with Stephen McDonald on, on the uh, on the Evo sequential chronograph. H how long did that take? And how did you imagine that? And how did you decide to work with Stephen on, on that? Is, do you think, oh, well, he's a chronograph guy or, or I don't know, kind of. That's a great story, uh, but it's a great question. So that's probably the most frustrating part of my world. Uh -huh. If you're a painter, as an artist and you have an idea, maybe three days, three weeks, maybe three months later your painting, except if you're maybe Leonardo da Vinci, but mm -hmm. your, your painting is finished. As a, as a mechanical high-end watchmaker, whatever idea we have, it'll take three to four years for completion. Wow. Because you've got minimum of 18 months to 24 months of engineering. Yes. Then you've got all the prototyping, mm -hmm crafting all the parts for the prototyping, debugging it, then doing a pre-series, and then even just crafting, crafting a piece like that, which has got 585 components in the movement, is a 16-month is a process, way after development is finished. So this is a, so it's an incredibly frustrating creative process where whatever idea we have is gonna take three, four, five years to come out. Um, Stephen McDonald? Mm -hmm. It's probably, I've, I've met a lot of very talented people in my life. I'm very, very uh, lucky. He's the only genius I've ever met. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Stephen McDonnell is from Belfast. Mm -hmm. He's a theology scholar from Oxford. He wow. never went to watchmaking school. And he actually became a professor of watchmaking uh -huh. without ever going to watchmaking school. Incredible. Um, he taught himself on the internet, in books, and he helped my company in 2007. I had a 
big glitch and he helped me. He was one of the watchmakers who helped me save the company in 2007. And then in 2011, um, I, I met up with him and I said, so what would you like to do? Is there anything you've actually got in mind? And he said, I think I'd like to do a perpetual calendar. And I said, look, honestly, Stephen, never. I'm never going to. The amount of times I've said never in my, my company <laughs> that I've actually done stuff is, is insane. And, um, and so um, I, I didn't want to do a perpetual because they're so sensitive yes. and they keep on jamming and blocking and, mm -hmm. and jumping the date when they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. And when that doesn't happen, the customer himself or herself presses the, 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 the button of uh, the, uh, the change of date mm -hmm. at the wrong time between 10 o'clock in the evening and 3 mm -hmm. o'clock in the morning because he hasn't realized and he jams the whole movement. And so I said, look, I'm not, I'm not going to do a perpetual calendar. He said, but they don't work. But there's a simple reason. The whole construction doesn't make any sense. Right. I said, what, what do you mean? He said, we've been doing this for the last, I don't know, 150, mm -hmm. 200 years. He says, and so? Because he never was, went to school and people didn't tell him that's how it should this be. This is how it should be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he taught himself trying to understand. He said, it doesn't make any sense. And in three and a half minutes, he showed me how 200 year old techniques and engineering didn't make any sense. Incredible. I was like, okay, so <laughs> what are we going to do about this? He said, look, I've got a few ideas. They're not really clear, but mm -hmm. I think we could go here and there. And so we, we, we dived together into the story mm -hmm. and um, make a long story short, it took him four years and single-handedly with, with the help of our team, he created this revolution, which was the Legacy Machine Perpetual, mm -hmm. which is a completely uh, pain-free perpetual calendar, incredibly complex, incredibly beautiful, mm -hmm. but actually works and never jams and never has any issue. And it's been going on since 2015. Amazing. So that's a revolution. Mm -hmm. And in 2016, I'm having dinner with him and I just bought a pocket watch split second chronograph okay. at, at an auction and I'm right. like, very proud. I'm yeah. showing him on my phone. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, look at this. Mm -hmm. And he's looking at it like, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -oh. So I'm like, I see you're not impressed, uh -oh. Stephen. He says, oh, chronographs make no sense. I'm like, okay, I've already heard that <laughs> five years ago. Okay, <laughs> so what would you mean? And something which I never actually knew because all chronographs have that issue. So you sort of take it for granted. He says, every chronograph, when you start it, loses 30 degrees amplitude on the movement. So wow. <laughs> for, for anybody, the amplitude of your balance wheel is what describes your, gives your precision. Mm -hmm. And so when you lose amplitude, you lose precision. So just at the moment when you start timing, the moment you need your precision, it's already that's where you've got the least. Uh -huh. And there are many other issues. He said, don't start me on split second chronographs with all the, the, the clutches. Mm -hmm. It's an absolute train wreck <laughs> as far as amplitude. <laughs> so the whole timing of a chronograph is off at the moment you need it. I'm like, wow. okay, um, so do you have an idea? I have an idea, but I'm not ready. This is November, 2016, in January, 2018. He comes to see us and he says, I think I've solved it. Now, this guy keeps on solving these insane riddles that nobody's asked him to solve. And he actually <laughs> created the very first chronograph, which doesn't lose a degree of amplitude when you start it. And from there, uh -huh. he was able to create this incredible movement uh -huh. with two independent chronographs, mm -hmm. which are linked together and independent. And when you both work, you don't lose a degree of amplitude. Uh -huh. And on top of that, because of all that incredible innovation, He's actually created four functions, which is never, so two of them have never been in a, in a mechanical chronograph, and two of them have, but in separate, if you had two chronographs, mm -hmm. and 585 components, of course, and that's, I think, something we, we have to emphasize, we are still artisan watchmakers. Everything we do is hand finished. Yes is hand engraved. Mm -hmm. You've got hand engraving, all the interior angles, all the angling is done by hand. It's still something which is, I think we're a handful of artisans which still do that because that's the watchmaking I fell in love with yes. 31 years ago. So yes. we continue that. So not only is it a feat of engineering, it's an incredible piece of artisanship. And so we're, we're hoping to craft three to four a month and um, the waiting list, and I'm sorry to talk about that, are just <laughs> insane. But um, that is why I entered this 
this world yeah. 30 years ago. That's why I fell in love uh -huh. with it. And that's what I want to continue doing with MBF. And that's that's the beauty, isn't it? Not 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 the not the commerciality. It's the beauty that got you into it, and and, and it's it's an extraordinary looking timepiece. It really is. It's it's just amazing. Um, and, and are there other extraordinary things that you, you do? Your collaborations with with Lepe, for example, um, a Rouge for uh, another, and then. Um, and then works you've done with uh, with uh, with H Moser with uh, with Bulgari, uh, all those uh, sort of extended collaborations. But but I love some of the Lepe clocks you do. I mean, I think the Balthazar and and and, and sort of the, the things that look like space stations are just incredible. And the T Rex is a, is, a, is 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 a beautiful thing, and it's they're incredibly imaginative. And again. I, well, I say I don't know how you come up with these things, but um, we're really, really glad you do. Um, and we've, we've got some examples in in, in our store, and it, uh, they're, they're quite fantastic. I just wondered briefly um, how you feel about the the kind of rise of the independent watch brands. You know, um, over the last well, so since the, since the late nineties, early two thousands, you've got the uh, Erverk, uh, Richard Meal, Richard Meal. Um, uh, Grubel Forcey, etc., and yourselves, all, all developing and all um, all challenging, I suppose, to a certain extent, the the, the orthodoxy of traditional watchmaking in, in their own way. And twenty years later, they're all still here and and um, and growing in importance uh, and, and 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 prestige and desirability. Um, I mean, it, it's. We're glad. I mean, we're re we're really glad about that. It keeps it, it keeps the whole industry um, interesting and uh, invigorated. It's interesting because um, it's true that most of us started in the I was going to say 1998 to 2005. That's mm -hmm. um, where this whole new current of contemporary yes. watchmaking started. And you know, um, artistic currents usually start in opposition to the previous current. Right. And uh, and so we'd, we'd had the resurgence in the early 90s um, to 2000 of this classic watchmaking, mm -hmm. which was had been saved. Yes. So we all went to get the tourbillons and minute repeaters mm -hmm. and the perpetual calendars and the chronographs, which basically what had been done in pocket watches, we made smaller on a wristwatch yeah. sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, And there were a few of us, a handful who said, we want to explore something else. Mm -hmm. and, and if you take typically the François Paul Jones and, uh, and the Orwerks and the Grubel Forces, mm -hmm. all of us did that, again, not because it's a business, yes. because there have been some pretty tough years for all of us. Mm -hmm. And there were, there were no clients out there because, of course, it's a bit scary to come and give it that amount of money to a small brand which you don't know if it's going to be there next year or in five years mm -hmm. and who's going to take care of the after sales service and yeah. and a lot of people are very status oriented mm -hmm. and when you wear an MBNF even today 17 years later 99.9% .9 of people have no idea what it is you won't get mugged on the streets that's a good thing <laughs> and and so yeah. you you realize that the sort of typology of customers we found we're real watch lovers. We're really people who are right up on the food chain in mm -hmm. knowledge and didn't care about showing off. Mm -hmm. They were about, we fell in love with this product, but also this reason why we create the brand and why we're entrepreneurs. And the why is very important. And, um, and they, they were also, um, they were patrons of us, of all of us. We couldn't live without those patrons. Mm -hmm. And I often say, for many, many, many years, close to two decades, actually, I felt like a very lonesome dolphin in the middle of the ocean where mm -hmm. I'd send my little sonar out and there are millions of fish who don't understand anything. And from time to time, that beep would come back and somebody actually got it. Yeah. And, and so um, that's been going on for, um, since the early 2000s. And now in the last two years, I know that clearly the whole moment of COVID, there was an insane acceleration mm -hmm. where the spotlight suddenly was put on us, not from us, yes. because we didn't have more means. Mm -hmm. The world woke up to the fact of these incredible creators who are following their path, who still do things artisanally, incredible engineering, incredible creativity, still hand finishing their products, which is what, for me, is the only reason watchmaking should exist. But that's me, I'm a little bit extreme. And, um, and suddenly, 
instead we've been crafting 200 to 250 pieces a year or so more or less i'm going to say 16 to 20 watches a month for mm -hmm. better part of the last 10 years and suddenly you've got thousands of people saying i want what you're doing uh, like first you were a little bit shell-shocked mm -hmm. and then afterwards you're like now how do we deal with this yes and we are who we are because we're a small company yes and we are who we are because we assemble these incredible people. Mm -hmm. And if we start growing and hiring more people and hired guns, that is going to go mm -hmm. to pot. Yeah. So we want to keep who we are. Remember, the reason I created MBNF is to be proud. Yes. And that pride is necessary. Mm -hmm. So um, it's going to be interesting. Yeah. Because for all of us independents, this demand has also led to also, unfortunately, speculation mm -hmm. and secondary market, insane yeah. prices and so on. And now, our big part of our job, which used to be trying to find somebody who actually liked what we did or understood what we did, has now become in making sure that what we do goes into the right hands. Yes. And the right mm -hmm. hands is people who actually love what we do for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. Meaning, not because you can resell it yes. with money, but because you actually want to wear it and you Absolutely. understand what we do. And um, it's very weird and I, I, I'm not happy about it. I'm not happy about the fact that we suddenly have to decide who is worthy or not. That mm -hmm. seems so wrong in so many ways. Yeah. Um, but that's what we have to do today, yeah. is make sure that it gets into the right hands mm -hmm. of people who are actually going to nurture what we spent thousands of hours and decades now because we're getting to the second end of our second decade trying to achieve I, i'm convinced um uh, this is the evils of social media and instagram culture that people can instantly see things that they never thought you know by following somebody they can get exposed to 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 brands that they um they would have normally taken years to find out about or or maybe never even find out about and and i think that probably what spreads the word and it's a good thing because it attracts people but on the on the other hand it does give you the problems you, you have in terms of uh, waiting lists and, and to a certain extent playing god with the clients which is a, an, uh, an unenviable task i think social media has really changed our whole landscape it, it certainly it? has yes first of all initially i was thinking oh my gosh it's basically unif how do you say, uniformizing? No. Democratizing? No, it's about every, everybody suddenly had the same taste. Yes. Everybody wanted a 5711 mm -hmm. with a blue dial. And everybody wanted that Rolex. Yeah. And everybody, when before social media, in Japan, people liked watches like this, mm -hmm. and in the US like that, and yeah. maybe in the Middle East like that, and in, in Europe like this. And there were like tribes everywhere, mm -hmm. and everybody had their different tastes and their different brands. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it was been going like that for decades. Mm -hmm. And suddenly everybody wanted the same products. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking, oh my gosh, this is like, it's pasteurization. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it's a, you, everybody's got the same taste. Yeah, yeah. But actually what happened is in parallel to that, tribes on social media arrived. Mm -hmm. And so we started having this incredible voice. I think MBNF has got like 290,000 followers, all organic, we've never bought a follower. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and we craft 18 watches a month and at pretty crazy yeah. prices. I mean, not yeah. for, for everybody. And so I was thinking, suddenly we had such a following mm -hmm. created, which we never would have had before social media. So in one way, everybody's got the same taste, but in the other way, small artisans like us suddenly had a voice which we were never ever dreamt of. So there is a, there's a yeah. good part. Oh yeah, for sure there is, yeah. For sure there is. It's probably a good point to end, although uh, I, I, I could imagine a Netflix series in this. I've, I've enjoyed <laughs> it immensely. Thank you very, very much for your time, Max. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I think your passion uh, for, for what you do really, really comes through. And it's it, quite a sort of corporate world. I think it's a, it's an absolute delight. There are, there are people like you still making watches and, and, and doing doing the things that you love and finding people who, who, who share that passion for, for that sort of creativity. So thank you very much, Max. Uh, my great pleasure. It's a big, big step for us uh, being here in Watches of Switzerland. And um, I, I'm really looking forward to what this is going to give. And uh, after all the story I've told you, mm -hmm. it's going to be interesting how we can share that yes. with everybody and 99.9% .9 of people who have no idea who we are. Mm -hmm. And I'm really looking forward to that. Thank you. Thank you.